I was in the basement, attempting to unhook the drain in the air conditioning unit, when I heard the phone ring. Natalie was cleaning the dishes in the kitchen, so I assumed she'd answer the phone. I heard her pick up the phone via the vent on the second floor. Hello, Catherine. It's nice to hear from you. How long has it been? I did not like Katie. She was Natalie's high school acquaintance, and I had never liked her. Fortunately, we moved out of Lancaster soon after being married. I wish it were a little farther away. Yes, that is what I thought. The past eight years have flown by. What's happening? I didn't like how this talk was going, but I only heard one side of it. Katie, wait a second. Steve is working in the basement. Let me go. Close the door. I will be right back. I heard Natalie hang up the phone and moved across the room to close the door. I walked through the basement and swiftly grabbed the wall extension cord. Hello, Catherine. I am back. What were you planning to tell me about Nat? Next weekend, the Holiday Inn in Lancaster will host a medical device conference. And guess who's going? You are kidding. They will both be there. Both of them. They're coming in Friday night and staying for the weekend. How do you know this? Jared contacted me this morning and said he really wanted to see you. He requested me to contact and see if I might invite you to visit Lancaster for the weekend. It will be just you, Jared, and Martin. I held the rag to the end of the phone. I really wanted to jump through the receiver and grasp Katie's neck. What the hell was she suggesting? I do not know, Kathy. If I can get away, I'd love to attend. I'll have to coax Steve once I find out. I will call you back. Do you remember how much fun we had at the last convention when they were here? Don't you, Natalie? You're right, I am. I give the kids breakfast every morning. I cannot believe you had the audacity to name that infant Jared. Why not? Steve does not guess anything. He believes Jared is his, however. They don't look alike. Damn. This conversation was getting progressively worse. I rapidly replayed the incident in my memory and discovered that eight years earlier, Natalie and Katie had an affair with these two guys, and Natalie had became pregnant by Jared. She had passed the baby off as mine and naturally never mentioned the affair. Natalie and Katie were preparing to get back together with these guys. Kathy, I will call you back as soon as possible. If I can't get away with an overnight stay, I might be able to come over for at least one day. It will be better than nothing. Okay, please call me as soon as you know. After we all hung up the phones, I had some time to reflect. We have three children. Jenny and Lynn were in high school when Jared came along roughly eight years ago. The two girls are attractive and have bright personalities. They are studying hard in school and getting ready for college. Jared, on the other hand, seems uninspired. He isn't interested in education or sports. I like Jared despite his weaknesses. Natalie opened the basement door. How are you, Steve? Are you prepared for coffee? I'm almost finished. I'm going upstairs now. I believe I'll take a shower before doing anything else. Following a lengthy, hot shower, I sat in front of the television with my family. I was trying to decide what I should do. Natalie had made a significant error that she later regretted. This was something she had done consciously, and intended to do again. I wasn't sure if I wanted to halt it and keep the status quo or fix the problem. If I determined to solve the issue, I needed to figure out how to do so. I felt silly because after 20 years of marriage, it had never occurred to me that Natalie might be having an affair. Steve, I chatted to Kathy from Lancaster today. She invited me to come down and spend the weekend with her. Do you have any issues with that? No, not really. I will be busy at work, so if my parents can watch the kids, that will be good. On one condition. What is that? Remember to bring your cell phone in case there is an issue. Okay. Thank you, sweetie. I'll bring my cell phone with me and I swear there will be no problems. The Volvo will not break down and I will be able to do a lot of shopping with it. I'll probably leave Friday morning and return Sunday night. Will that work for you? I believe it's quite good. Have fun. Natalie stepped out into the kitchen and I overheard her contact Katie to confirm their weekend arrangements. She didn't appear to care that she was cheating and might face consequences. I told her I wanted to work on the computer before going to bed and would get up later. Finding the website for the East Coast Medical Equipment Dealers Convention in Lancaster was simple. It included everything about the convention. All of the exhibits were mentioned, together with a floor plan and a schedule of lectures and seminars with times and locations. There was also a list of all the exhibitors, including their hotel room numbers. Jared Kramer and Martin Blank were staying in room 411 from Friday to Monday. I discovered home locations and phone numbers for both in Baltimore. I found a company that provided DNA tests via mail. 
The tests varied from paternity to likely national origin. Most tests are less than $100. Samples might be collected at home, mailed with a check, or paid online. I filled out an online application form and paid for the paternity test using PayPal. After printing out the sample collection instructions, I gathered all of the necessary items to collect the samples. I produced a mailing label and packed a padded envelope for priority mail. I prepared several CD mailing cartons and a stack of blank CDs. Jared and Martin's wives are likely to desire a copy of the evening's activities. I worked for a corporate security consulting firm. My work schedule was flexible, but because I had free time, I chose to take a week off. Another advantage of the job was the availability of many tools that I might utilize to acquire information. By this point, I'd very much concluded that I was done with the marriage. The fact that she had an affair eight years prior and forced me to raise a child was horrible enough. But Kathy's fooling about and making a fool of me was too much. I couldn't forgive that. And now she was at it again. It has to end permanently. The next day, I collected DNA samples from the children. They thought it was cool. Then I went to the bank and deposited nearly all of my funds into a trust for Jenny and Lynn, leaving $12,000 in cash. I was able to set things up so that the trust was protected from my wife or a devious divorce counsel. I made arrangements to cancel all credit cards and checking accounts on Monday morning and start a new account in my name exclusively. I was going to lock the home so Natalie would have to go somewhere else to sleep. I was confident she could find a legal way inside the house, but I hoped to have other matters resolved by then. We could make a decision concerning our kid Jared later, even though he was not mine. I felt responsible for him. I stopped by the Seymour Slumps office. Seymour had been my lawyer since we began reading. He was honest and hardworking. I liked him. I tried to convey the situation to him as clearly as possible. He pushed me to ensure there was no possibility of reconciliation. In addition to the divorce processes, I requested him to contact Jared Kramer and see what he could do for my son. I offered to pay $500 a month in child support retroactively or have him foster the child. The final alternative was for him to waive all rights to Jared so that I could legalize their adoption. I was confident he'd agree to the last option. Seymour had all he needed. I agreed to send him photos and audio tapes he could use. He provided me an office, an email account, and a shipping address for printed goods. Betty Moore was the most annoying real estate agent I have ever encountered. There was absolutely little about this woman that I liked, but she was a hard-working, dedicated employee. I marketed our property for sale and executed many powers of attorney for her. I told her Natalie would have to collect any autographs she needed herself. She chuckled and said there would be no problem. I informed her that the locksmith would provide her with a new set of keys and a wireless video camera disguised as a smoke detector. It was the best fit for the job. I took two of them in for bug testing. I also needed a clipboard, a pair of cubes with the company logo and three laptops. I issued an order on business letterhead to replace the defective smoke detector in room 411. I packed the PCs and recording equipment in a standard suitcase. I carried a little stepladder with me. The Holiday Inn had room 311 available, which I reserved under a different name just for Friday. It had Wi-Fi internet. Walmart offered the best deals on discarded cell phones. I took two, just in case. My parents moved into an ancient farmhouse outside Lebanon a few years ago. It was too enormous for the two of them, but Dad had always wanted it. He owned a large garden, hens, and an orchard. Jared enjoyed going there. They were willing to put up with us for however long it required. Dad liked Jared, but named him Jake. He used to say Jared resembled a sandwich salesman. Jared seemed to prefer Jake more than his real name. A few years ago, Dad purchased a large motor home and a small child to tow it around in. He used it three times before losing interest in it. I instructed Daddy to get the motorhome started and ready. I knew the girls would be unhappy about having to leave their pals for the summer. They still had one year of high school remaining before college, and they intended to attend a prep school in Vermont. Natalie refused to spend the money, despite their age difference of a year. They were in the same grade. Do not ask. I had no idea how Jared would take it. I would address the problem at school later. Right now, I had other issues to cope with. At the very least, all of the kids enjoyed spending time with my parents. Natalie departed early the next morning. She got all dressed up and thanked me again for allowing her to spend time with her pals. 
I encouraged the youngsters to prepare for their trip and bring enough supplies to last the entire summer. The females grumbled as much as I expected. When I told them to bring brochures from the prep school in Burlington, everything turned out well. They packed all of their school clothing with them just in case. Surprisingly, Jared appeared to be enthused about the vacation. Jenny stepped up to me and stood there. Jenny, what do you need? Are you already packed? Dad, I'm 17. I'm not a kid anymore. Tell me what's going on. I'm not sure I understand what you mean. Are you and your mother having problems? I do not think that is something I would like to talk with you. If there was anything going on, Mom and I would attempt to conceal it from you. Why don't you pack the remainder of your belongings? No, Dad, I am serious. This time, however, things appear different. Lynn and I want to know what's happening. We believe we have the right to know. I didn't want to say anything to her about it, but I knew it was going to come out eventually. Okay. I'm not really pleased with your mother and I's connection. Things are not going well. I'm not sure what's wrong, but I know something is wrong. Is your mother cheating on you? I paused for a long period. I'm not certain, but I think so. Jenny turned and shouted as she ascended the steps. You were correct, Lynn. What does this mean? Better let Lynn tell you. Lynn was heading down the stairs towards Jenny and me. Tell them, Lynn. Do I have to? Yes, he knows, but you still need to tell him. Lynn stared at her feet. Eventually, she spoke. Approximately four months ago. I was skipping school with one of the guys in my lab class. We dropped by the house so I could purchase some CDs. It was a Wednesday and mom typically goes shopping. Were you at work in Boston? I believe we were walking down the street when we noticed a gold SUV come into the driveway. Floyd, who works with you, got out of the car and mom left him at home. We sat outdoors for nearly two hours before he came out. I waited another ten minutes before entering the house. Mom was taking a shower and your room was completely messed up. I left and returned to school for the remainder of the day. When we arrived home, she had already begun dinner. The bed had been made and there was a mound of linens in the dryer. I informed Jenny, but she did not trust me. Nobody said anything for nearly 30 seconds. Thanks for informing me, girls. It's not something I wanted to hear, but it's excellent that you informed me. Jenny detected a tear in my eye. She took Lynn's hand and they headed back upstairs without saying anything. Dad showed up just as the locksmith arrived to change the locks. I put Natalie's clothes, shoes, and personal stuff in three-gallon garbage bags. The bags almost fully filled the rear of my navigator. After conversing with the gals, I decided to stop by work before going to the conference center. It began as a local business but quickly expanded throughout the area. Their marketing team did an excellent job of identifying prospective areas for expansion, but the company was unable to train employees quickly enough to fill them, particularly in managerial positions. They tried to talk me into a new office and gave me many different locations in an attempt to pique my interest. Natalie refused to move and refused to discuss the possibility that if I stayed where I was, I would be stuck there indefinitely. Moving would result in a promotion, more money, and increased power. I went straight to the business president's office. Is Mr. Turcotte available for a few minutes? I believe he can squeeze you in, Steve. Wait a minute. I'd always loved Turcotte, the secretary, and I suppose she felt the same way about me. George Turcotte emerged from his office and offered his hand to me. I hope you've come to tell me good news, Steve. Yes and no. Helen, please bring coffee to the office and hold my calls for a while. Okay. What can I do for you, Steve? First, I've decided that I'd like to be considered for one of the new leadership posts in the area where you believe I'd be most useful. That is excellent news. If you don't have a preference, I have a fantastic option that I'd love to choose. How do you feel about Anchorage? Believe it or not, that sounds ideal. Would the first week of September be suitable for you? I think it will work. I'll start doing everything on Monday. What is the second thing? I realize that seems crazy, but I wish Floyd Cooper had been assigned there to work for me. George slumped back in his chair, chuckling. You found out, right? I'm not sure what you mean, Mr. Turcotte. I couldn't keep a straight face while saying that. Steve. Nobody wanted to tell you anything. I didn't like what was happening, but I had no idea what to do about it. Suppose I fired Floyd. I was worried you would find out, and I didn't want this to happen. I decided it was best to keep things quiet. Unfortunately, Floyd Cooper turned out to have a large mouth. 
he began bragging about his romance with your wife. Tracy, Floyd's secretary, approached me and objected when he began exhibiting images of himself and your wife that he had downloaded on his computer. The legal department is currently working on something, but I've kept them on a short leash to protect you. Now that you know, I can just fire Floyd. It is far more sensible than paying the money to transfer him to Alaska, only to fire him later. You're correct. I hoped I could cause a little more damage, but I suppose retribution is a horrible management strategy. I'll go with whatever you think is fair. George pressed the intercom button. Helen connected me to Tracy Tolliver. After telling Tracy what we were doing, we had to complete Floyd's office. Floyd was at work in Allentown. Tracy Tolliver was a very attractive woman. She was just under 30 and she was maturing gracefully. I had always been attracted by her golden hair and blue eyes. She stood barely a few inches taller than five feet, but she carried herself like an Amazon. I've never understood how Floyd ended up with the best secretary in the whole building. I later learned that she had requested three times to be transferred to my office, but my secretary refused to give up her seat. You will need these. She handed out four blank CDs. Look under bills payable and click on Stoddard. Make one for yourself, one for your attorney, one for the legal department, and one for Floyd's wife. I've got postcards ready, but I need your attorney's name. I was astounded by her efficiency. This woman understood exactly what she was doing and how to accomplish it. Seymour slumped. His office is located on Franklin Street. George and I proceeded to Floyd's office, where Tracy began typing up the last address sticker. There were 20 photographs of Floyd and Natalie having every type of intercourse imaginable. They were low quality and appeared to have been captured with a webcam. It also implied that Floyd likely had a full-length video somewhere. They were not filmed in our bedroom. George attempted to be courteous, but he couldn't stop staring at my wife like that. I felt a little upset because every male in the building had most likely seen what I was staring at right now. After I checked them all out, I simply copied the file to each of the blank CDs. Tracy looked around the room. When you've finished copying that crap, delete the entire file. I handed Tracy the four discs. She put each one in an envelope and returned one to me. Do not let your children get hold of these. I will ship these three on Monday morning. I informed George about my intentions for the Holiday Inn. He did not appreciate the company's involvement, but he agreed. We had a work crew in the area on Monday, and he promised to have them come by and remove the cameras. I was about to install George, and we shook hands. I thanked him, and he thanked me. I believe that was an excellent meeting. The travel from Reading to Lancaster took roughly an hour, with parking in the back lot. I checked in, paid cash, and received a key. The first thing I did was change into work attire. The maid on the fourth floor seemed kind enough. I gave her my work order, and because no one else had checked into the room, she let me in. Installing the phony smoke detectors took around 20 minutes. The room contained two double beds. I was able to set the cameras to capture a good view of each bed and part of the room. Not a big deal. I was a professional. I hope none of the occupants realized they were in a room with three smoke detectors. I returned to my room, changed my clothes, and began putting up all of my equipment. The pizza delivery guy arrived about a half hour later. By three o'clock, everything was ready. Both cameras were working flawlessly. Despite the room's typical lighting, the photographs were clear. My laptop operated well with a high-speed connection. I programmed one camera to record whenever there was movement and triggered the other manually. Damn, I liked my work. I had one difficulty. I wasn't sure where Natalie was. I phoned her cell phone number. Hello, Stephen. Isn't that an excellent caller ID? Hello, Natalie. I just want to make sure everything is going okay. The kids are with my parents and I am still at work. Where are you currently? We are still at Kathy's. Ray, her husband, will supervise their children. Kathy and I are planning a sleepover at Melanie Thompson's place. A couple other girls from school will be present. It should turn out fantastically. This sounds like fun. Take some images of your perverted dreams. Who is Ray, the guy Kathy is with? Do I know him? I believe so. That's Ray Wilson. He was on the same soccer squad as you. Yeah, it is correct. I remember Ray. How does he look? A little heavier, balder, and softer. This sounds like natural aging to me. Okay, Natalie, I am letting you go. Encounter fun and please contact me if you encounter any troubles. Love you. I love you back. Bye.
I remembered Ray as a large, vicious son of a bitch. If they were leaving, they would be here shortly. I assumed they'd take Natalie's car, which I was cool with. Around that time, there was some activity in the first camera, which began recording as expected. There was a lot of idle discussion about the entryway and other things. They were both quite large men. Jared had black hair and dark eyes, whilst Martin was slightly bald and pale. Both seemed to be in good form. The bug detected the ringing of Jared's telephone. Hello, this is a horse farm. What can I do for you? They had a great time together. I wondered how many times they'd used it already. We're here, honey, and we are hot trotters. What do you like? I assumed he was talking to Katie. Okay, this is the Outback. I'll meet you on the stairs in two minutes. At least they planned to feed them first. I sat there, freaking out over everything. If I weren't so preoccupied with the mechanics of what I was doing, I'd probably be preparing to stomp someone. I quickly exited the room and made my way to the stairs at the end of the hallway, which were located around the corner of the building. I noticed Natalie and Katie waiting for me in the foyer. They giggled like two schoolgirls. A minute later, Jared and Martin stepped out of the elevator. Natalie instantly took Jared's hand and kissed him on the cheek in the same manner a wife kisses her husband. They went out and got into a black Mercedes driving away. I looked around the lot and saw the Volvo parked in the final row. At the very least, it made an effort to blend in. Within five minutes, I was already packing garbage bags with her clothes and other stuff into the van. I was confident she'd return from the dinner a little tipsy and not see anything in the car. I put a letter on the driver's seat saying that the house locks had been changed and that I would be taking the kids on an extended vacation. I stopped at Taco Bell to fortify my system for the rest of the evening. They'll eat ribs, and I'll grab a burrito. Suprema. Life simply isn't fair. I returned to my room and waited for the inevitable. I attempted to figure out what else I could do. It took nearly an hour before they returned to the room. I knew what was going to happen when they arrived, but I wasn't sure what to do. I concluded that they had not convened to play canasta. I knew what was going to happen for the rest of the evening, and I wasn't pleased. I suppose Natalie and I were doing great. I assumed she was pleased because she never grumbled or expressed unhappiness with anything. When Jared was born, she told me all kinds of stuff. She stated that she was delighted we had a child since every guy should have a son. I wondered if she had called Jared's biological father to congratulate him at the first opportunity. Damn, that was depressing to think about. I hated spending all these years with this lady who could cheat on me at any time and not feel guilty about it. A woman who could force me to raise someone else's child and find it funny. It was difficult to feel compassion for her at that point. I continued to prepare all I needed. I suppose I was overprepared, but this was my only chance, and I didn't want to miss anything. They rushed into the room, laughing and giggling. Martin had brought a bottle of some kind of drink, and they were able to fill four glasses in the first minute. Katie removed two pillows from the bed and flung them on the floor. Okay, let us begin. I couldn't believe I was seeing my wife make love to another man with such intensity. I was not only irritated, but also jealous. The cameras were working flawlessly. I had to pull my gaze away from the orgy to ensure I was shooting everything. It was nearly as good as a typical adult film. I am getting near! Jared screamed, get ready for dessert. Thank you so much, Martin. You could have at least let me know you were prepared. Consider how many good things I've squandered over the years. I was able to capture several photos using my Zoom camera. After that, both couples had active missionary sex. This episode provided me with some excellent photographic opportunities. It was break time in room 411. Katie had gone to shower and Natalie was brushing her teeth. Jared and Martin were just lying down and sipping beer. I grabbed the discarded cell phone and phoned Baltimore's number. Hello, Mrs. Kramer. Walter Perkins is attending the medical device convention in Lancaster. Are you Jared Kramer's wife? Yeah, but he isn't here right now. I understand your husband and Mr. Blank earned special distinction at today's event. We would like to give you photos from the ceremony. Do you have an email address that we may send them to? If, of course. It's ekramer at bbw.net. That's great. Do you have Martin Blank's wife's email address, so I may send the photos together? Sure. She is in the back blank at Volcom. Okay, that is all I need. You will have the photos in a few minutes. Sure. She could have monitored the data flow over the hotel's wireless, but I didn't care because I had no connection in room 411. They took a moment to converse and regain their energy. So, Natalie, is your loving hubby looking after my son for me? 
Of course, silly girl. It's been eight years, and the moron still doesn't understand the baby isn't his. Steve lives in his own universe. He couldn't have known he received a letter in the mail. It would be lovely if you could send a birthday gift or anything every now and then. Yeah, that would be amazing. All he needs is to see something like that to give him a hint. Katie was cut in hell. I have three snot-nosed kids running around my house, and my dummy is not their father. He's so busy drinking beer that he'll never realize they're not his. Everyone laughed at poor Jay, and I captured a good sound clip. I was growing tired with everything, so I decided to call it a night. I logged in and connected to an unused room. After a few entries, I had a live feed from room 411 to the website. I included a headline on the page, Natalie and Katie do, Jared and Martin. My wife and her girlfriend decided the break was over and started getting the guys in for another run. The webcast was going well, and the number of viewers had exceeded 100. It took me about 20 minutes to get everything I needed to put together. I left the live streaming computer for last by now. Over 400 perverts had watched the show, and I'm sure a few were recording it to distribute. Later, I turned off the last rig and called Ray Wilson. Hey, Ray, are you sober? Yeah. Who's that? Just a friend. Ray, I want you to listen to something. I played a short audio clip I recorded with Kathy. Son of a bitch. Where did you get that? Ray. She's in room 411 at the Holiday Inn. There are two guys there, and they're pretty big. So if you plan on going take a bat or something, or they might beat the shit out of you. Ray didn't say a word, and I heard the phone rattle. I had just finished loading the Navigator when Ray jumped out of the Ford pickup with a short aluminum bat for a Little League game and stormed into the building. I was tired but enjoying the ride back to Lebanon. The motorhome was all ready to go. I gave Dad a set of keys to the new house. Mom would go to Lancaster to see Natalie while Dad took the boys to our house and moved all the furniture and stuff out. They had plenty of room to store things in the barn. Mom thought it would be interesting to hear the story from Natalie's side. My parents had the number of one of the discarded cell phones. I have my own cell phone, but I plan to have it turned off most of the time. On Monday, my dad will take the stuff in the Navigator back to Centrex. It was too late to start, but I wanted to be away by the time Natalie figured out what was going on. We had reserved an RV parking lot near Hagerstown where we could get on the highway in the morning. The girls planned the trip for us. They did a pretty good job. The only thing I did was limit the distance between stops because the gasoline was killing me. I was glad I brought a lot of money with me. We finished our three days at Disney and were heading to Chattanooga to see the aquarium. Jenny asked if she could call her mom. Hi, Mom. It's Jenny. Yeah, just wanted to let you know everything's okay. Yeah, yeah, I know. We're all having a good time. Even Jared. We missed you, too. We'll call every couple of days to let you know, okay? Tomorrow night, we leave for Orlando. We will be at Disney for almost a week. We have park tickets for every day. I couldn't believe it. My daughter was framing her mother. That's so cool. We're staying at the Orleans Hotel right in Disneyland. It's going to be so great. Okay, we'll call you in a couple of days. Bye. Jenny, I can't believe you did that. It was really rotten. I know, Lynn, and I thought it would be appropriate. You know, of course, that your mom is on the phone right now buying a plane ticket and booking a room. That's what we thought she'd do. She needs a vacation anyway. Picked up Lynn. Jared, watch the DVD and enjoy his company. Two weeks later, Lynn called her mother. Natalie was very upset because she had spent a whole week looking for us in Orlando. Lynn said that we had decided to go to Six Flags and tried to change the subject of the conversation. Lynn and Jenny kept her on the phone for almost 20 minutes, listening to her rant and rave. Finally, Jenny said she was sorry if she had misled her and would call her back in a couple of days. My demons giggled for another half hour after they hung up. The next week was hectic. We parked at Smoky Mountains, and the kids were busy while I took care of business. Seymour delivered the divorce papers to Natalie. She didn't know I was doing it until he arrived. He said she was having a seizure. He explained that she could hire an attorney to fight the divorce and told her what she was facing. He had pictures of her and Floyd, the group in room 411, and the results of the DNA test. Jenny and Lynn were mine, but not Jared's. Natalie hired a lawyer, but ended up going along with what Seymour suggested anyway. Seymour visited the big man, Jared, in the hospital in Baltimore. Kathy's husband did a great job on him, and Martin Ray was facing about five years in prison. 
I asked Seymour to help him. Both of my wife's lovers were in the hospital for over a week, and while they were recovering, they were served with divorce papers. When they were discharged, they had nowhere to go. Jared signed a paper waiving all rights to his son Jared, in addition to broken bones and ribs. Ray had literally smashed their genitals with a bat. The doctors didn't hold out much hope for recovery. Betty Moore found a buyer for the house. It took her a lot of work to convince Natalie to sign the papers, but she finally got her to sign. I didn't have to sign anything or go to the closing because I had signed the power of attorney. The summer was quickly coming to an end. I had a chance to develop a good relationship with the kids. I spent a lot of time talking to Jared. He loved it in Lebanon, where mom and dad lived. I asked him if he would like to stay on the farm full time, and he immediately agreed. Dad really liked having him around, and I knew he would love to take him in. Seymour filed adoption papers so that my parents would have the legal right to provide for him and take care of him. The only thing Seymour didn't like was getting Natalie to agree to it. Natalie didn't know it, but her father had also gotten Jared's name legally changed to Jake. The girls fell in love with school in Burlington. The end of summer in Vermont was beautiful. We spent a few days getting them settled in. And then Jake and I headed back to the Keystone State. I contacted Mr. Turcott and found out that everything was ready for my move to Alaska. Tracy was already in place and had set up a temporary office. This was good news. She had also rented an apartment for me and had the company car ready for my arrival. I left the navigator with my father to get rid of. Six months later, things finally settled down. The divorce was final. The girls did well in school and both received scholarship to James Madison University in Virginia. They were happy and excited to be on their own. Natalie hadn't heard from Natalie except for a few phone calls. Jake was doing better in school and he was head over heels in his new hobby of raising bantam chickens. One day, Natalie came to visit him. She was driving an old Ford Escort and told her father that she had to sell the Volvo to pay for her divorce expenses. That was total bullshit because I ended up paying for both lawyers while she was there. Natalie insisted on calling Jake. Jared. Jake corrected her each time and eventually left. Natalie began to lash out at my father, talking about how vile it was to take away a child's birthright. My father said it was too easy a blow, so he refused to take it and just left with Jake. Jake's mother never went back to him. She received $11,000 from the sale of the house. Katie and her decided to celebrate the divorce and went to Las Vegas. All the money was gone in four days. I don't know what Natalie is doing now or where she lives. Maybe she moved to Baltimore. Needless to say, I love Alaska. Let's get to the next story. I-32 male just discovered. My wife, 30 female, cheating in our marital bed a few hours ago. Right now I'm holed up in my dad's fishing cabin trying to wrap my head around what I do from here. I feel destroyed and worthless. I feel anger due to that rage. My entire life just got flushed down the toilet and I have absolutely nobody to talk to. The one person I thought I could talk to just betrayed me and tried to lie about all of it. I just scared the hell out of three people, one of which was me. If the cops aren't looking for me right now, I'm lucky if they are. I'll deal with that when I'm forced to. I work in construction demolition, to be specific. The crew I work with travels often, and I've been gone 10 days out of the 14. I was supposed to be gone due to rain. Very difficult to blow up with things. And the forecast? I decided to catch a plane back home until I was certain we could work again. The flight I took didn't get in until midnight. I wanted to surprise my wife, so I didn't let her know I was coming. I drove the 45 minutes from the airport to our house. Eight years ago, my wife found some beautiful acreage far from any other homes through her job in real estate. Two years later, I was finished building our house, which we have loved ever since. We have a four-car garage, so any cars parked in front is unusual. A black SUV I didn't recognize made my heart sink. I instantly knew, I mean, I hadn't sensed any troubles with our marriage. We hadn't had any fights. Our sex life was great and frequent, but I knew somehow right then and there what I'd find once I went out. If the car had belonged to a relative of hers who was visiting, she would have let me know. Part of me hoped it belonged to a female co-worker who had a little too much wine during a visit and needed to sleep it off, but that would have been highly out of the ordinary. I sat outside the house for at least 15 minutes thinking things through, but I parked my car about six inches from the driver's side of the SUV, which was parked beside a retaining wall. 
Whomever it belonged to wouldn't be entering their car to leave without my saying or breaking out a front or back window. I cut off my car and entered through the back door via the deck. I have a concealed carry weapon permit for a gun. I had put on my holster before getting into my car at the airport and driving home. I wasn't afraid for my life, but I was afraid of losing my temper and taking the life of someone else, walking into my house. Everything was quiet. At first, I didn't think anyone was home, but with a finished meal for two on the table and a sink full of dishes, I knew something was up. I calmly walked down the hall to our bedroom and slowly turned the knob. I pushed the door open, but didn't hear any commotion or movement at all. The room was pitch black, dark. I walked over and turned the light on in the bathroom. When I turned around, there was my wife completely naked, laying on top of some naked guy I'd never seen in my life. I was crushed. It felt like someone had just laid a pound 100 boulder on my chest. I felt tears welled up in my eyes, but I knew tears were pointless and would do nothing to help the situation. I pulled out my phone and began recording. I walked around the bed videoing the pile of flesh in front of me. It began to sink in that my marriage was over. I realized all of our property would be divided evenly, even though I've been 100% faithful. I suddenly realized the house I built with my own bare hands would have to be sold when we divided assets in the divorce. Being physically betrayed felt worse than any pain I could have imagined. Knowing I was getting ready to be financially gutted to nearly made me lose my shit because it seemed so unfair. But I knew damn well I was done with her and would never touch her defiled body again. I was disgusted by what I saw, but mostly at my wife. In my mind, she had gone from sweet, devoted wife to alley-crack whore in the span of 15 minutes. Neither moved at all. I was fairly certain they were both passed out drunk. Since the house was going to need to be sold, I suddenly didn't care about any damage to the house I'd worked so hard on. I pulled out my point four or five and just looked at both of them betraying me and my own bed for a second or two. I contemplated shooting her, knowing those bullets would pass right through and kill him as well. But I came to my senses and realized neither were worth getting the electric chair over. And despite the hurt I was feeling, I knew I might want to keep on living after all was said and done. So I pulled back the hammer of my gun, lifted the gun into the air, aiming to my upper right and fired off two rounds into the ceiling. They both woke instantly. She was trying to push off of him to turn around. He shoved her off of him and into the floor when he suddenly locked eyes with me. Fear doesn't adequately describe the look in his eyes, but compared to the sheer terror in my wife's eyes, he looked rather calm. She tried to tell me it wasn't what it looked like, so I fired around through the bedroom closet door. She shut the fuck up really quickly while he still hadn't said a word. They were each seated on opposite sides of our bed with a sheet pulled up to their necks. I asked the guy who he was and he said his name was Marcus. I asked my wife how they knew each other and she explained he owned his own real estate company. Then I asked how long the cheating had been going on because I had been totally clueless that my wife was cheating. She had the audacity to claim that was the first and only time they had slept together. So I fired two rounds into the bed's headboard between them. They both began crying and begging me to stop. So I asked the question again. To my surprise, Marcus answered six months. It pissed me off, but at least I knew the truth. I asked my wife when she stopped loving me and through tears she lied and said she never stopped. I fired two rounds into the bathroom on her side of the bed and she began screaming as glass from the mirror shattered all over the counter and floor. I told her she was a lying, worthless war and I was done with her lies. She was clearly having a panic attack with good reason, but at the moment I didn't care. I asked the guy if he was married. He replied that he was. I asked if he had children. That would miss him. He swallowed before admitting he had two children. I told him I truly appreciated him showing me that my wife is a tramp before we two had children together. But I asked him if having sex with a cheating slut was worth losing his wife and kids over. He begged me not to tell his wife. I told him to shut up because at that moment she had about a 50% chance of her ending up a widow. For the next 15 minutes, I paced at the foot of the bed with a gun drawn, just trying to think. I knew holding them there against their will could be deemed to be taking hostages. I knew I would have to eventually let them go. I told my wife to get up and go get her car keys. 
She got out of bed and began to reach down and get her clothes off of the floor to put back on. I told her to stop. Clothes weren't needed, and again, to get the keys. She walked down the hall and brought back her keys, handing them to me, still crying. I removed the house key and told her she wouldn't be needing it anymore. I know she wanted to protest. I couldn't do that. And that legally, she was right. But a point four or five tends to make debating legality moot. I then told Marcus to stand, get his keys and wallet out of his pants, and to follow me. I led him outside toward his car, where I punched him in the face repeatedly until his nose and mouth were bleeding. After I moved my car so he could get into his SUV, I went back, picked up his keys, told Marcus to stand up. I explained he could go home right then and there to confess everything to his wife, or she'd hear from me within 48 hours with all the evidence of his cheating I had recorded. I also explained he had 45 seconds to get off of my property, or a corner would be escorting him off of the property. The fact he had no clothes on seemed a secondary issue with the moment he got in his car and peeled away before I counted to 25. I went back inside where my wife had put on a robe and was seated at the kitchen table. I went to the bedroom, picked up her cell phone and brought it to her in the kitchen. I asked if she wanted to call her parents or her sister to pick her up. She refused. I even asked if she'd like to call the police. I think she anticipated us discussing things to clear the air. So she said no. She began to try and explain, but I stopped her yapping and told her we were done forever as far as I was concerned. I explained our home was no longer her home and she needed to get in her car and drive anywhere. That wasn't our house. I explained I no longer felt any love for her at all after what she'd done, and there would be no second chances. She began to apologize, cry, and plead. Two rounds fired into the double oven and one into the fridge brought blessed silence. Having your nearest neighbor over two miles away has its benefits. I explained to her at that moment I did not care if I lived or died, and that she had totally destroyed me with her behavior. I also explained that all love I ever had for her turned to hate the minute I saw she and Marcus naked together. If I could have, Thanos snapped her from existence and my memory at that moment, I would have. I told her I was barely maintaining my composure with the feelings I had of loathing her. I said it would be best if she went to the garage, got in her car, and drove away forever. Through tears, she went out in the garage, got in her car, and left. That was about five hours ago. Realizing I may have committed a crime or two with my reaction, I didn't want to deal with any cops that happened to show up. I turned off everything and locked the doors before going out and getting into my car again. My dad owns a fishing cabin he and his buddies use fairly often. I drove here and used the hidden spare key to let myself in. It was far too early to call anyone when I got here. I decided I needed a drink and I'm about a quarter way through a bottle of my father's Balvany scotch. Dad is going to be pissed about that until I tell him what my wife did. Plus, I'm pretty certain it's the bottle I bought for his birthday last month. I really don't know what to do. I've read through posts here and other subs on Reddit looking for answers, but most seem to be people trying to figure out if their spouse is cheating. I already know the truth. Well, I know as much of the truth as I want to know. The reasons for infidelity all ring hollow. Other posts seem to be some strategies to get a cheater back. Why anyone would want to get back a cheating spouse is beyond me. But I want a divorce. I want it in my favor and as fast as I can get it. She doesn't have the option to pick me ever again. I'm a human, not a carnival prize. I want to remove her from my life and burn any reminder of her in my life. I don't want to ever see or hear from her again. Can everything be taken care of by lawyers? I have money to get things started. What I don't have is the time, energy, and patience to be dealing with this bullshit. Eight fucking years of marriage down the drain. Eight years that I now consider one huge lie. Because after what I just saw, how can I accept anything she has ever said to me as truth? Eight years of my life wasted on an evil bitch fraud. Part of me is wishing I had shot them both and just taken my own life. But that may be the scotch talking. Jesus, I have to get my shit tested just to make sure that Ford didn't give me anything. Actually, I've pissed away a decade on her now that I think about it. Her actions have invalidated my life and negated any value to my time with her. The only thing I will be taking from this marriage is that honesty and loyalty are things from the past. The only thing forever about any relationships anymore is herpes. That shit is forever. Love and marriage are all fucking lies. Really? Really down right now. 
Some, I'm sure, are already viewing me like some knuckle-dragging Neanderthal for responding with violence and threats. I also know some will give me grief for the use of one of my guns. I didn't shoot anybody and the bed sheets were already soiled before I fired a shot. If bullet holes reduce the price, the house can be sold by a few thousand. I can live with that. I just can't deal with this shit. Part of me wants to just eat a damn bullet and give up. The life I had is over and it isn't coming back. Even if I wanted to. People are going to say I dodged a bullet irony. Not having kids with my wife and finding out she's disloyal, it doesn't feel that way right now. I go from crying uncontrollably to rage like I've never known. Either I face this or just end it all. And right now, the second choice seems like the better option. Maybe if I pass out and get a little sleep, things won't seem as bad, but I doubt it. The weather forecast looks like things will be clearing up enough to work in a few days. So I will need to be on a plane the day before. I don't like the region we are working in for various reasons, but part of me just wants to stay there when the job is done and not come back. Part of me wants to figure out where I want to start over if I want to even deal with starting over. How do I decide what lawyer to get? Is there a rating system online for legal assistance on Yelp or some other site? I hate damn lawyers, members of the scummy-ass legal profession. Now I have to find the most hardball lawyer I can find. Sorry for the wall of text. It wasn't as cathartic as I hoped, but nothing is going to remove this heartache anytime soon. What the hell am I supposed to do? What is the point of doing anything? The person I was focused on giving my all for is gone forever. And tonight I learned never existed. I wasn't perfect by any means, but I was faithful. I was never abusive. She'd never heard me really yell until tonight. I was a good husband. I liked being married and faithful. But for every good guy out there, some slut is just waiting to get her claws into him so she can ruin his life for her gain. Fuck this life. Fuck my soon-to-be ex-wife and fuck relationships. I'm just rambling now. Guess I'll go to bed when I wake up. I guess I will call my parents and fill them in on what went down. I'm just in shock, and I've never had heartache like this in my life before. Maybe tomorrow I'll feel better. Update one. I'm honestly not sure if things could have gone much worse for me after posting if I tried, and yeah, I'm sure some will say what I do went too far was over the top or whatever. It seems the law agrees with those people. This update will be a joy for the anti-gun commenters. So let me get this out of the way first so those people can be overjoyed with what I'm facing. I was arrested for communicating threats, felonious assault, assault with a deadly weapon, and a few misdemeanors, felonies that don't really matter if convicted of the felonies, even with no criminal record. If found guilty, I could get over 25 years behind bars. I'm not likely to be sentenced to that long a time in prison, but it is possible. Amazingly, if I'd actually shot Marcus and or my wife in a fit of rage, I'd probably be looking at less time while I was writing my first post. It seems Marcus went to the police instead of to his wife to confess. He admitted to the cops about being found with a married woman, but he apparently managed to get some sympathy from the police. The deputy that took his statements was one of the sheriffs who showed up to arrest me the next day. Everything went peacefully with that, as I didn't resist in the least. In hindsight, I think getting me charged was a preemptive strike by Marcus, because the judge at my arraignment forbade me from having any contact with Marcus or any of his family members. So I have yet to contact his wife in any way, shape, or form. But by getting the arrested, he accomplished a couple of other things. I informed my job of the charges which would not allow me to leave the state. They went into panic mode because my job is so specialized. It took them two weeks to find someone with the same training and experience, but now I'm looking for a job. That's certainly true. A kink in to getting lawyers before I could even think about getting a divorce attorney. I had to focus on a defense attorney. I was served divorce papers two days ago. It's apparent my wife is going to try and take me for everything, but she and I have not talked since that night. She has called and texted, but I haven't read, answered, or responded to anything. I fucking hate her guts. I'm never getting over this. I'm not going to be able to move on. I'm not getting anything close to my life back. I've been staying with my parents. They have been awesome and very supportive, but this situation I've gotten myself into, there isn't much anyone can say. Right now, everyone is so focused on the criminal charges I'm facing and not going to jail. The fact I've lost my wife and future has been put on hold, so to speak, even after getting divorce papers. I've heard my mom crying for me in private. This is destroying my parents as well. They shouldn't be worrying. Their son will be spending time behind bars. They should be focused on their retirement and enjoying life. 
I guess I haven't just ruined my own life, but I'll be damned if someone didn't destroy mine. I spend most days holed up in my childhood room waiting for the other shoe to drop. I have reason to believe that my wife is assisting Marcus or the police against me in criminal court. She sure as hell isn't obstructing anyone, that's for sure. Again, I haven't talked to her, so I don't know what is going on in her head, but if she hates me for what, I do not know. As much as I hate her, I guess she's giving me what I deserve. I apologize. I can't give a better update. Those who always fall in the lead and divorce them camp will be happy to know that will be happening come hell or high water. I just don't know if I will be doing it as a free man, or if it will happen while I am behind bars finishing my sentence. I was talking with my cousin the other night, and he said something to the effect about when I start dating again. He meant nothing by it, but it was just so I can't even explain it. Like, forget what my wife did to me, and never having trust in any woman again. I haven't even started to ponder that. And then it occurred to me, if worst comes to worst, my next date could be with some guy named Jerome. My lawyer is trying to actually win my case, not just keep me out of jail. I appreciate that. And that is what I need to happen. But I can't do prison if I'm convicted, even without jail time. My career is done for, but prison I can't endure. I've been in shock since the moment I turned the lights on and saw my wife laying naked on top of another man. This whole incident just keeps getting worse and worse. I feel like I'm watching a movie but can't stop. Even though I'm disgusted, this sounded a lot clearer in my head, but it looks typed out. But that was the best I could do under the circumstances. My life is utter hell right now, and cheating is 100% to blame. Edit. There are several responses in the comment section to questions and comments. I don't have it in me to type all of that out several times. Someone will provide an update in a month or two. If it's me, then great. If not, things got ugly and are only getting uglier. Update 2, I will try and explain what has happened since my update, even though I know I will give incorrect legal terms and words in the process. But from what I was told, it is a federal law for the prosecution and defense to present all evidence and potential witnesses before a trial. There was a reason my lawyer kept the footage of my setbacks and Marcus cheating a secret. It wasn't like a trial, more like a hearing, but there was a judge presiding. My lawyer actually introduced a USB drive as the evidence, but had the footage on a tablet. Long story short, Marcus either didn't know I had proof or forgot I had told him. I did remember putting my phone away after recording them before I pulled my gun. So he and my wife never saw the phone. He refused to testify and the charges were dropped. His father is a retired judge and he a business owner. He couldn't have that entered into evidence and seen by the public from a trial with his name attached to it. So I truly dodged a bullet. My lawyer is almost certain she could have gotten a jury to find me not guilty, but no charges or trial is even better. Marcus left the courtroom before I was allowed to go. As soon as I turned my phone on, I got notifications about missed texts and calls from a random number I assumed to be my wife. I didn't respond to anything because I didn't read or listen to anything, but I was sure she just found out I had video evidence. She was either trying to make peace or war. Her lawyer could talk to my lawyer and know I still have not communicated with her in any way, shape, or form. The moment I saw her cheating on me, she was dead to me. If I want to talk to the dead, I'll have a silence. I have a very reputable divorce attorney, and he was the person I was first trying to call after charges were dropped. Obviously, the footage will be needed in divorce court, so I can't go show it to Marcus' wife. Not yet, anyway. I think she'd hear about things through the grapevine, but who knows. He probably made some sort of preemptive strike and told his wife something just in case, but I highly doubt he made a full confession. My parents were relieved. I called them on vacation to tell them the good, unexpected news. We all were expecting it to go to trial. Nobody truly expected that hearing to end things on the criminal front. Now I focus on divorce, and my lawyer has my wife's filed divorce paperwork. It's not going to be the cakewalk. My setbacks thought it would be. As of right now, she is living in the house. That puts me at a disadvantage, but my lawyer is hoping to negate that with some filed paperwork. I do not want to move back into that house. I never want to live there after witnessing what I saw. Plus, I heard it needs some repairs and new appliances. But honestly, I don't want her to have it either, with housing prices through the roof. I want it sold outright as well as the land. She shouldn't get it if for no other reason. Being the one who broke up the marriage. If she wanted to keep living there, she should have kept her legs closed. Actions have consequences. 
And if she thinks getting some strange PhD is worth losing a house over, she really shouldn't be in real estate. On the job front, I plan to use this coming week to either get my old job back or get a new job. I don't want to knock anyone out of a job, especially in such a specialized field. But I have to pay lawyers to do things I never wanted to now. I know whoever replaced me cannot have the experience and knowledge I do in addition to knowing the team. I don't think I will be unemployed either way for very long. I never thought I'd say I'll be glad to get back to work. But the last few months haven't been a vacation. I just need something to focus on now besides the divorce. And I want to try and forget that fucked up night. I'm probably lucky I'm not dead. And I'm very lucky I'm not behind bars. But the whole situation just pisses me off. Not just the money. Pissed away on legal fees, the wasted time, the words I believed I now know are lies, the deception. I never knew her. I couldn't have. And to think I behaved like an idiot over someone I never knew was disturbing. I mean, if you want to go postal and beat the hell out of someone over a worthy, loyal, loving woman, have at it. But to go batshit loco over someone that lied and never cared. Not worth a single punch and certainly not worth the gunfire. Learn from my mistake. It isn't worth it. But yeah, if people could just be honest with themselves and others, that would be great. My mister keeps reaching out to communicate. The time to communicate was before she gave any part of herself to another man. I want to start over somewhere, not too far away from my parents, but far enough away to not run into my setbacks or her AP. I hate big cities, but small towns have a sucking this all their own. I make great money. Well, I mean, I did. And well, again, just starting over with new everything after the last couple of months sounds so appealing. I just can't think of anywhere I want to live. I just know now I don't want to live here. I am so glad we didn't have children. Or this experience would be far worse. It's such a comfort to be able to ghost her and move on without a child forever connecting anyone. And I love kids. I would still love kids one day. But thank God I didn't have any with a woman that could do that to me. At least I know I can have a life again. A career again. I'm really down on this whole thing called life at the moment, but knowing I have freedom and opportunity gives me hope I can move on from her is a huge mistake in my life, a tragedy of epic proportions. I know I need therapy after all of this and what I did. I have an appointment scheduled in two weeks to start individual counseling. I already know I will get blasted over anger issues, but I need to hear it and I need someone to help me put my life back together after everything came unhinged. I appreciate the advice given to me here. I appreciate the kind words and even the haters. What I did was fucked up. I admit that I can only better myself going forward. I can't change who I was in the past. Final update, marriage demolition. I've been pondering for days how to even begin to explain what has happened and where things stand. I owed it to those that have given me good advice since my screw-up to give an update. But just writing out what has happened and all the details and drama would take way too long. Our lawyers began corresponding my setbacks. W. Side kept requesting. She and I talk and I kept saying no. Our side tried pushing the negotiations and get the ball rolling on our side. Every time the house and property got mentioned, my lawyer felt they were acting twitchy, whatever that means but they still wanted to meet face to face and talk, saying it was very important for both of our futures going forward to partner together. I still wanted to say no, but my lawyer pretty much told me I'll have to see her in court eventually and we should meet. My lawyer wanted to know exactly what they would say, an angle they were playing. I just didn't want to see her or hear her voice. They weren't willing to do a group text. So we met. We met in a conference room at my lawyer's office, I was seated when my wife and her lawyer came in. I wanted my gaze to convey a touch of hate with ample disgust thrown in. She started crying and walking toward me, so apparently it didn't work. I told her to back the fuck up, which made her cry harder. I began moving back and away from her, which got her to stop coming forward. I'll spare everybody the specifics, but I pretty much cursed her out worse than any human has been cursed out before that fateful night. She'd never heard me yell at her before that day in the conference room. I'd never cursed her. Not even that horrible night. I let it all out. Every vile thing I had thought about her, every horrible thing I believed about her, and everything I wished would happen to her. Her lawyer was really shocked. Mine was just a little shocked. But I told him to expect it when he agreed to the meeting. My wife finally grasped I meant every word and hated her for what she'd done to us. 
what she'd done to me before the meeting ever started. We had to take a 30-minute break to calm down. When we actually did meet, my wife had a request to speak to me without interruption. I couldn't give a word-for-word -word account of what she said if I tried. So I won't. She started out saying she was extremely sorry for everything that has happened. She wished I would talk to her or answer her texts, but accepted that wasn't going to happen after what I said earlier. Then she went straight into telling me the land we owned could be worth a huge amount of money in the not-too-distant future. Apparently, a company I will not name but everyone has heard of might want to purchase a huge amount of land to build on. The deal would be conditional on getting other landowners to sell, and I'm talking about a ton of acreage that the company would be buying up. Our land is in a zone of the country X number of miles from a power station, X miles from a major highway, airport, water source, etc. It fits all of their qualifications. Then she said, we really need to discuss the land because she can't sell it without me. That is when I stopped her. I said, but you could have if I'd gone to prison, couldn't you? It wasn't a question. I knew the answer from her lawyer's expression. Then she came out saying she told Marcus not to press charges. Fuck me running. I wanted to hit someone, but I can't hit a woman. And my lawyer would sue me. I didn't care. They kept communicating after that night, but it still pissed me off. She said they had to stay in contact because he was the person behind the attempted sale. As the agent, he stands to make a mint. As the owners, we stand to make more. He has government and real estate connections stretching far and wide because of his parents' careers. But when he saw the opportunity to remove me from the equation, he took it. He never showed up anywhere naked. He had clothes in his car, but I didn't know. The cops got a very different story than what actually happened, but I'm not surprised. When I got charged, my wife claimed she wouldn't testify, but she couldn't get me to respond to her. She claimed she was glad I got the charges dropped. That was when I asked if she was glad before she found out I had recorded her and Marcus. She didn't answer. I let her and her lawyer see the footage I'd taken by passing them my phone. I don't think my lawyer wanted me showing it, but they knew it existed and I couldn't show it to anyone else yet. I told her that Marcus' wife would see that footage eventually. That's when she told me doing so would be losing out on a ton of money. I'd never been working my job. I asked if that was why she cheated. Money. Greed. I should be not. She actually told me she cheated for us. The argument that ensued over that comment alone went on for over an hour. We took a lunch break and I went off to eat alone for an hour just to get away from everyone. In one very odd way, she'd given me good news, but it was gift wrapped in shit. The lawyers loved hearing of the potential sale of land. They knew we'd find out about it eventually, and any potential immediate sale I would have to agree to. So they spelt I can nix the whole deal if I choose to. It won't cost Marcus a cent yet, but it would keep me from making a lot of money. But I can't make a lot of money unless my TBCCW makes a lot of money too. When I went back to the meeting, my wife pretty much explained how all of this got started. She was doing one of those parade of home showings. Marcus' agency was showing two of the homes. They knew who each other were from traveling in the same circles, but he approached her and asked if we were happy living where we were. From there, he explained, he knew an agent specialized in business manufacturing sites. He explained his idea, and I guess she saw dollar signs. Marcus, a trusted POS in our area, could probably buy up the land from locals much easier than someone they never met. The two agents working together could easily buy low and sell high. The deal couldn't be made without us due to the positioning of our land. Marcus and my wife got involved talking to locals and planning things out. Then they got involved physically. So six months before I knew my marriage had ended, it ended. She swore the two of them just got caught up in their excitement over the money. She said it didn't mean anything, it was just sex. I wanted to try and break my recent world cursing record, but I tried to not explode. I asked if she and I paused, used condoms. She said they did at first, but because she was on the pill. Well, six days. Six fucking days? I shouted before calling her a disgusting, worthless whore. She asked what I was talking about, so I proceeded to explain that when a man orgasms inside a woman, that's how long jizz can stay inside her. I really wanted to vomit, thinking about what she subjected me to. I asked how she'd like me go to a prostitute, stick my fingers inside, and then put them in her mouth. Yes, it's disgusting, but it's the equivalent of what she did. She tried to claim she took showers. 
I told her unless she was able to stand on her head, spread her legs to rinse out, she's a nasty slut. And she wondered why I look at her with a revolted expression. It's because I'm revolted. She's disgusting and subjected me against my will to shit. I don't even want to think about. That isn't even taking into consideration things she did with her mouth. Marcus can have the tramp. She's infected with his shoes now, but I had to get out of there. I was no more good for the rest of the day. I went and got drunk for the first time since my after party at my dad's cabin. Part of me should be really happy, and I am. I know if things work out, I'll be able to pay my lawyers in full, repay my parents tenfold, and have a huge amount of money to start over almost anywhere. But the BS I've had to agree to in order to get that money makes me sicker than my wife. Three damn lawyers wrote up an agreement. Our two lawyers wrote up an even split divorce. We cannot divorce until the land sells or the deal falls through. But the divorce will go through, and my marriage is over. It isn't like I'm in some hurry to be single so I can marry again. I fucking ghosted her really well, despite my unfortunate marriage status. It isn't like I have to see or talk to the immoral Jezebel, but it does bother me to still have any tie with her in any way. I cannot contact Marcus' wife, not now or in the future. I cannot show the footage of my wife to her parents or family, but she has told them we are divorcing and did admit to having an affair. Either way, I got my job back and start next week at a new site. There's talk of having the charges Marcus brought against me sealed from record or something, but my record is clean. Thank God. I'm still coming to grips with her excuses and her attitude about those excuses. Granted, I would be gone ten days at a time. At no point did I suspect anything and our sex life remained constant. I wish it hadn't now. At least the poor sobs and dead bedrooms don't have to worry about swapping spit with a stranger. Her putting her tongue in his mouth or anywhere else and kissing me was the equivalent of letting a stranger spit in my mouth against my will. But sick. Cheating trash like my wife and Marcus don't seem to grasp that. I can only imagine Marcus' sex life with his wife continued during the affair. I really do wonder if she has any idea. She went down on my wife by proxy at some point, knowing what I know now. I'm glad I punched Marcus in the mouth, still glad I didn't kill them or myself. But they are both disgusting. Like lick a hobo's ass in an alley on a pile of garbage. Nasty humans just disgust me now. How she could willingly give her body to two different men back and forth is beyond my comprehension. I'll work like I've done for years, but I won't have any place to come home to. She can stay in the house until the sale and pays all costs. The house will be demolished, so nobody will live there after the sale. The majority of our land is undeveloped. There is no way in hell to move the house out. And miles away, when I'm needed to sign paperwork, I'll be given notice, and I'll show up to sign. Then our roads part ways faster than my wife's legs for a $100 bill, and I can move on with cash in hand. But she ruined me, and it's not fucking fair. I had many opportunities to cheat over the years, but didn't for many reasons. Loyalty being first and foremost. But the idea of fucking someone I don't know who could have just been with any number of other people very recently, that's just insane. Condoms be damned. Those things break and don't protect from everything. There really is no safe sex except monogamy, but it only works when both people are faithful and haven't fucked half the East Coast. I could have come out far, far worse than I should if things go right. But we're definitely looking at next year before things can get rolling, should cheapen me just by being associated with me. She revealed truth. I didn't want to know because it all goes back to the first comment on my very first post. I know not every woman is like my wife. I can vouch and say not every guy is a POS like Marcus, but I'll be damned if those people don't fuck it up for the rest of us. Why does it seem to loyal people with a great bond never meet? Almost every post on here is a nice guy, great girl who got involved with a whore, man whore, and the consequences of that bad decision. Forget being able to trust again. I can't get past the idea of ever wanting to trust anyone like that again. Nobody is worth what she put me through, and she sure as hell wasn't. It pisses me off. He's going to get away with it. I guess the world will have to wait and see if karma can scare him like I did. I can't really see any reason for another update. She and I will divorce. Money will be deposited in my account and her account. And I will never see or speak to her again. That's how it will end either way. It's just on hold indefinitely. I want to thank those that gave me advice, told me to keep my mouth shut, and urged me to get lawyers to those that told me to stay strong. I appreciate you.
To those that felt I should eat a bullet, go eat a hobo diet, I will wait a day or two after posting to respond to a few comments. Then I'll probably go away. I pray healing for everyone who has been cheated on. I wish it upon myself. Thank you for taking the time to hear today's tales. If you enjoyed the article, please feel free to like and subscribe if you haven't already. If you have a tale to share with me regarding your own or someone else's circumstance, please do not hesitate to contact me. Take care.